to turn to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. And uh, our, our text uh, for this morning will be the first 19 verses, the story of Naaman, uh, the Syrian general who was a leper. So uh, let's uh, give our attention to the reading of God's word. 2 Kings 5, 1 through 19. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She waited on Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. And so he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive, that this heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He'll surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? And so he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then, when he says to you, wash and be clean? And so he went down and he dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and came and stood before him. And he said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And so Naaman said, Then, if not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either a burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Yet in this thing may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the temple of Ramon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow down in the temple of Ramon, when I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. Then he said to him, go in peace. And so he departed from him a short distance. May God add his blessing to his word among us today. <coughs> well, as we read earlier at the beginning of our time, Jesus said in Matthew 18 that unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And by saying so, the Lord taught us that our faith must be meek and trusting. It must be humble and unhesitating. And this childlikeness of faith is a very precious thing in the eyes of our Savior. He also taught us that we must be converted in order to have this childlike faith, converted by the sovereign grace of God from the, the inherent pride and self-reliance that we have as sinners to the humble and trusting faith of a child of God. Now, this episode from Elisha's ministry, I think, powerfully illustrates these points that our Savior made uh, 
And this passage from long ago in Israel's history still contains within it our Savior's call to us to have childlike faith. Now, the teaching of this passage, I think, takes place by way of a contrast between two main characters. The first main character is obviously Naaman. We're introduced to him in verse 1, and he's a very powerful and prideful man. Verse 1 of our text says he is great and honorable, a mighty man of valor. And we learn later on in the story that he was a prideful man as well. Whenever he was told to wash in the Jordan River, he thought that was quite beneath him. So that's Naaman, powerful and prideful. But the second character we're introduced to in verse 2, and she's the exact opposite of Naaman. She's an unnamed little servant girl. She's a captive of war. She's a servant. And she has faith in God. She has faith in the true God of Israel. There's no doubt in her mind that the God of Israel could heal Nathan, Naaman's leprosy, and she was right. So the initial contrast here is between a great and powerful unbeliever versus a young servant girl who believes in the one true God. Now it's important to note that in the Hebrew text, the Hebrew text describes this girl with the phrase na'ara katona, which means literally she was a little girl. And in the story, when Naaman finally humbles himself, and he does what the prophet says, he washes in the Jordan River seven times, Verse 14 tells us that his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And the phrase in Hebrew is na'ar katon, which is the exact masculine equivalent of the description of the little girl in verse 2. In fact, I would translate verse 14 as being he's, his flesh was restored like that of a little boy. And so as this description is repeated, a little girl, a little boy, as this description is repeated and reflected in Naaman's conversion, I think the point of the story is that he became like her, not just by the healing of his skin, but through the gift of true renewal, renewal that gives childlike faith. <coughs> and Naaman makes his new childlike confession of faith in verse 15 of our text, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. And so this great, powerful, prideful man became just like the little child at the beginning of the story, who directed him to the true God in faith. Now as further proof that Naaman's renewal was spiritual and not just physical, verse 14 of our text says that his flesh was restored. That's the word used in the English in the New King James Version. But in the Hebrew text, the verb used there is the verb shuv, and it's the verb that is almost always, in fact always, translated as either return or repent. This is the verb that the prophets most often use for repentance. That's the verb used in verse 14. And there's a play on this verb here. The same verb is used in verse 14 as in verse 15. In other words, his flesh was restored and then in verse 15, then he returned to the man of God. The same verb is used there for the changing of his flesh and his returning to the man of God. Now, when he returned to the man of God, it was to repent and to confess his faith. And the same verb used to describe his repentance and returning to the prophet is the very verb used to describe the restoration of his flesh. Again, a verb that is almost always translated to repent in the Old Testament. Now, even more interesting, the Septuagint, or the Greek version of the Old Testament, uses the Greek verb epistrepho here in verse 14 and 15, which means to convert or to be converted. That is, the Greek text literally says, his flesh was converted to be like the flesh of a little boy. And... In Matthew 18, which we read earlier, that is the exact verb that Jesus used when he said, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And so when Jesus said this, he almost certainly had in mind the story of Naaman and how it illustrates our need to become converted and become like a little child. Naaman became like a little child. 
as he confessed his faith and was converted. Now, it's important to understand that Naaman's leprosy was not just an allegory. He really did have leprosy. But the healing of his leprosy was an outward illustration of the inward work of regeneration. The renewal of his skin to be like the skin of a little child outwardly illustrated the renewal of his heart to have childlike faith. Now, in the Old Testament, we know that physical diseases, especially leprosy, are often seen as an illustration of the unclean condition of man's heart. And God's power to heal the body is a, a, a very common illustration of his greater work of cleansing and converting man's soul. And that is why Jesus went about in his ministry healing all kinds of diseases to demonstrate and prove not only that he could heal the body, but to demonstrate and prove his willingness and his power to convert the heart. Right? To cleanse the heart. And Jesus said as much in Matthew chapter 9. Just before healing a paralytic man, he said why he was doing it. And it was so that you may know that the Son of Man has power to forgive sins on earth. Arise and take up your bed. This is exactly what Naaman learned. And this is what we learn from Naaman's story. That the Lord is willing and able to forgive sins, to restore our souls, and to give us childlike faith. And this is the greater healing that we all need. Now, we've already seen how Jesus seemed to reference the story of Naaman in Matthew chapter 18 with a call to all of us to have childlike faith. But on another occasion, Jesus referenced this story very explicitly in Luke chapter 4. When Jesus was opposed in the synagogue of his hometown in Nazareth, from there he was determined in his heart to take his ministry elsewhere. And he said to them on that occasion, he said, many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. In other words, there were many people in Israel who, who needed to be healed and who could have been healed, but God chose to only heal this one foreigner. The point Jesus made was that just as it was in Elisha's day, if his own ministry, Jesus' ministry, was also rejected in Israel, then he would go to the Gentiles. And he did. From that point on in his ministry, he went to Galilee of the Gentiles, which is Upper Galilee. But the point he also made is that God's grace is a sovereign grace. God saves whom he wills to save. And it's all according to his choice, his wisdom, and his good pleasure. Now this too is illustrated in Naaman's story. In the story, the king of Syria sends Naaman with a letter and gifts to the king of Israel and asks him to heal Naaman. Now, the king of Israel, who is unnamed in this chapter, we know, however, it was Jehoram, who was Ahab's son. What does he do? He flies into a rage. He tears his clothes. He says, am I God? Can I, can I heal someone's leprosy? The king of Syria is only trying to pick a fight with me, only trying to start a quarrel. Now, Jehoram, we know, was a prideful and an evil king. And it never crossed his mind to send Naaman to the prophet to be healed. Even that young servant girl knew to do that because of her faith. But the king of Israel responded in his own childlike way, didn't he? And not in a positive sense. He threw a temper tantrum. And obviously he had no trust in God or in God's prophet. So this is the story of not one, but two powerful prideful men. The Syrian general is saved, but the king of Israel remains in his sin, bested by the wisdom of a little girl. The point is that God is sovereign in salvation. The Lord had chosen Naaman to be one of his children, and he gave him childlike faith. But he left the king of Israel in his own pride and unbelief. The sovereignty of God in salvation is the very element of this story that Jesus emphasized in Luke chapter 4. Now there is one last way that Naaman's faith comes out, his childlike faith comes out in this passage. In verses 11 and 12, we saw that Naaman had an angry outburst at the suggestion that he dipped seven times in the Jordan River. He said that the waters of Israel were far inferior to the waters of Damascus. But that was the old Naaman. 
After his conversion and his confession, what does he do? He asks to take two mule loads full of dirt from Israel back home with him. The point is, if he couldn't stay in Israel, he was going to take a little bit of Israel home with him. And he wanted to do that in order to create a suitable place in his homeland to sacrifice to the one true God. At first, he looked down on the land and the waters of Israel, but then he couldn't leave without taking some with him. Now, this whole business of this land being better than that or these waters being better than those, of course, at first, that was a point of nationalistic pride in Naaman's heart. But at the end of the story, it's not just nationalistic pride. This man with childlike faith now loves Zion. Psalm 102 says of Zion that God's servants take pleasure in her stones and show favor to her dust. Naaman literally showed favor to her dust and wanted to take some home with him when he went home. Now, what does all that mean? We love the stones and the very dirt of Zion. What this means is that to God's people, everything is precious about the place where God chooses to meet with his people. That's a precious place. In the Old Testament, that was the land of Israel. But in the New Covenant, God meets with his people corporately in the church, wherever they may meet in the true church throughout the world. But the point we see in Naaman's story is that childlike faith produces a love for Zion. And childlike faith produces a determination to worship the one true God faithfully. Now, Naaman had to take a few truckloads of dirt home with him in order to accomplish that. But what does this commitment look like in our lives? What does it mean for us to love the dirt of Zion? Well, it means simply we need to love the church of Jesus Christ. We need to love the head of the church, our Savior. We need to love the people of the church, our brothers and sisters. We need to love everything that concerns the church. We need to consider the stones of the church precious and to show favor to her dust, as the psalmist said. And we need to be t determined in our hearts to be faithful worshipers. Now, regarding Naaman's worship, our passage ends with a somewhat odd request by him. He asks the prophet, when I go home and I'm helping my master into this temple of the Syrian god Ramon, and uh, I have to help him in the temple, and he leans on my hand, and I happen to bow down in the temple. When he bows down in the temple, uh, what about that? Is, is that okay? May I be forgiven for that, please, he asks. Um, now, uh, commentators are divided on this. Some say that was a needless compromise of his newfound faith, and others uh, take it in a more positive sense. But his request in the text is met favorably by the prophet. The prophet simply says, go in peace. So I do think that we have to look for a positive interpretation. Perhaps the prophet's permission for Naaman to do this is based upon the same reasoning of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 8, when Paul talked about eating meat sacrificed to idols. The question in that case was, can you eat meat sacrificed to idols in the marketplace? Right? And Paul's answer was, yes, you can do that, as long as you're not violating the conscience of another believer. But his reasoning was, you can eat meat sacrificed to a false god because a false god is just that. It's false. It doesn't exist. So meat that is offered to a false god is meat offered to nothing. So eat it with a clear conscience, Paul said. So perhaps Elisha gave Naaman permission to help his master into the temple of Ramon because there is no Ramon. And how this reflects favorably on Naaman's faith is that he was not going to worship the God of Israel and the God of Syria, as most people did in the ancient world, worship multiple gods. That was very common. Instead, Naaman knew that there was no God named Ramon. He knew that the God of Israel was the only true God. And he said so in verse 15. He said, now I know there is no God in all the earth except Israel. But be that as it may, that issue and that controversy about this text I think the main lesson is this. Our faith, your faith and mine, is bound to be challenged in precisely the same way that Naaman's faith was challenged. He found that the job that he had, the traditions out of which he came, and the culture in which he lived all presented a very difficult case of conscience, didn't it? 
Now, he did the wisest thing. The wisest thing was to do what? Seek counsel. That's what he did. He went to the man of God. He didn't just rely on his own judgment, but he went to the man of God and he asked, what should I do? What? He, went to, he went to Elisha for guidance. And this too is an element of childlike faith. Think about it. Previously, Naaman pridefully pontificated to Elisha about how he should do his job and how he should heal him. I expected you to come out here and wave your hand and heal me. And he was very prideful toward the man of God. But that was the old Naaman. The new Naaman humbly comes back to the prophet seeking his counsel on this issue of conscience. So what does all this look like in our own lives? Well, childlike faith does not rely upon its own reasoning, but it seeks out the guidance of the Lord. First and foremost, directly through the scriptures, but also through the elders of our church and other wise people that the Lord puts in our lives in different ways and in different times. So that too is an element of his newfound childlike faith. Now in conclusion, I want to return to this point of having childlike faith, and I want to simply define what it is. Because Naaman illustrates it, the Lord Jesus Christ commands us to have it, so what is it? What are those good qualities of faith that make it childlike? Well, let me, in conclusion, suggest to you three elements of faith that make it childlike. Those elements would be trust, dependence, and simplicity. And these will be short points, uh, so don't worry. Trust, dependence, and simplicity. And I think perhaps the most basic understanding of childlike faith has to do with implicit trust, unreserved trust in the Lord. And the point is that we cannot trust our own instincts. We cannot trust our own thoughts, or opinions, or inclinations. That we must have it as our first instinct, go to the Word of God to seek the counsel of the Lord and then follow that with absolute and utter trust, knowing that we will never be led wrong by the counsel of the Lord and He will always lead us in the right path. Just as a child depends on a father or a mother, to make those decisions, to lead them in the right way. We must have that same trust in the Lord. And I think this aspect of childlike faith is best summarized by Proverbs 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. The second element of childlike faith, I think, is dependence, full and utter dependence. And of course, uh, the metaphor of the parent-child relationship stands behind this whole description, right? And think about children. Children are utterly dependent on their parents for everything. I mean, the IRS even calls them that on your tax form, right? Dependents. How many dependents do you have, right? Because that's what they are. They're dependent. And I think this element highlights that childlikeness, being utterly dependent upon another for everything. And the point is that we must constantly be mindful of the fact that without Christ, we would be utterly lost. We would be nothing and nowhere and dead in our trespasses and sins. In this regard, we must be like children before our Heavenly Father, consciously dependent upon Him alone and always thankful for what He provides. Finally, childlike faith is a simple faith. I think that's illustrated in the story of Naaman because Naaman didn't, don't, didn't know much. He made his confession of faith. There's one God in Israel. I know that to be true. He didn't know much else. He didn't know the, the prescriptions of Moses. He didn't know Israel uh, history. He didn't know anything. But he knew there was one true God. He knew as much as the little girl at the beginning. No less, but no more, right? But that was true faith. That was sincere faith. It was a simple faith. Now, we should always aspire to grow in our knowledge, to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So by simple, I don't mean simplistic. I don't mean content with just a little bit of knowledge. We should always be growing in that. After all, we're disciples. We're learners. Christ calls us to, to learn of him and to grow in him. But by simple faith, I mean this. No matter how much you know, or no matter how long you have been a believer, the basic truth of the gospel and all of its glorious power and simplicity should always be at the core of your soul and never far from your thoughts. It should never cease to move you with wonder and with praise. The basic reality that the Son of God gave his life for a wretched sinner like you that fact should dominate your every thought, and it should be the one truth that you live upon and die upon.
These are the elements of childlike faith I think we see illustrated in 2 Kings chapter 5. This proud, powerful man with leprosy had not only his flesh restored, but his heart restored to be like that of a little child. He was humbled to trust and to depend upon the one true God with a simple and a sincere faith. So in conclusion, I, I call upon you to examine yourself for this childlike faith. Have you received Christ like a little child? Do you trust him implicitly? Do you depend upon him entirely? And do you love him with the simplicity and the sincerity of the love of a little child? This is the faith that Christ desires of us and the ones to whom he promises the kingdom of heaven. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we do pray that you would give what you command, that you would give to us each and every one this childlike faith that trusts you implicitly, that depends upon you entirely, and that has a simple and sincere love for you like that of a child. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. May it bear fruit in our lives with childlike faith. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are over time, but I thought maybe we'd sing uh, just a few stanzas of 102b. And this is the psalm um, which I referenced in the sermon about the, the stones and the dust of Zion being precious to uh, God's people. Let's sing just the eighth and ninth stanza of 102b, just those last two stanzas. Let's stand to sing. Your